Welcome to the High Value Sales Show of Eversprint.com. I'm Malcolm Louie, the Managing Member of Eversprint, and today we're speaking with Matthew Putman, the founder and CEO of Nanotronics, a company that combines microscopes, AI, and robotics to create the most advanced factories for the 21st century. Welcome to the call, Matthew. Oh, thanks. Great to be on. Matthew, you grew your company's revenue from $2.9 million in 2014 to $4.8 million in 2017, a 66% increase, and now you're on track to hit eight digits in 2018. But before I ask you how you grew your company so fast, can you perhaps recap, describe a bit about what your company does in general layman's terms and how you differ from the competition? Yep. First of all, we, te we tend to not think of our, our, our company as having competition. Now, in some ways, that's not true. We compete with ideologies on how factories should run, and there are companies that make instrumentation for doing inspection and for, uh, that use all of those things you said, artificial intelligence and robotics. But we go about it in, I think, dis a, a different enough way that we tend to not think about competitors as much as customer relations and trying to create something new. Um, so we, we started the company, I started the company about so nine years ago now, um, to solve a problem that I was seeing when I was an academic. Uh, and that was that an enormous dreams that I had and others of my generation for what could be the future of nanotechnology. So things that could, you know, memory devices that could be made the size of a salt crystal that would have the memory of a server farm or, uh, or molecularly precise robots that could work in your body as, a, as a, an immune system or into your brain. Um, so really big dreams that have existed for a long time but could not be scaled. Um, we took a you know, 400-year-old technology, which was a light microscope, and used computational methods. So we used, I think, the best of what was available for in computer processing at the time um, to be able to, you know, see larger things at better resolutions. So it's incredibly small things on large things, which would allow this dream of nanotechnology to happen. Um, luckily, through those years machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence have become ubiquitous and powerful enough that we could start to use those tools as well. Um, it was a natural thing that if we're going to put these into factories, these high power microscopes that, that are basically uh, powerful because of computer algorithms, including artificial intelligence, being able to have robotics to move samples around and have more control in those factories became a nice step. So we did an acquisition of a robotics company. So now we combine those things that, uh, that you mentioned before. Awesome, fantastic. Can you share what were the three biggest drivers of your sales growth over the past four years? Yeah, the, you know, a, a big part of it is, you know, it's, it's funny to even talk about sales going back very far. And even these revenue numbers are not very large in many ways. Because when you're starting to do, or at least when we're starting to do something new uh, that industry hadn't seen before, um, all of our customers we considered partners. And, you know, so in the way they're beta customers or partners. So it takes a few years for them and for us to figure out the best way to use our equipment. So a lot of it was having very few customers that were dedicated to try to do things differently and to improve efficiencies. So once they did start using our equipment, they started buying more of it and they started buying more of our software. And then their supply chain started buying it so that they could be, you know, comparing apples to apples and working with the same platform. So it, it grew very organically in that way. It's only been in the last year or two that we've really added um, salespeople and agents. Um, and so that's why we are starting to see rapid sales growth now, uh, really because we're now trying to have rapid sales growth, not trying to just develop the product. We do continue to develop products and 
do extensive research to try to make sure we do keep up with the latest technology and the best technologists, but we also have a product that we can just deploy uh, around the world. Okay. Uh, so uh, just from my notes and just to recap, it sounded like the three biggest drivers of your growth, it kind of changed over the past few years. Um, at the beginning, it was having a new product and having new customers. And because they're both new to the customers and a new product that you're developing, they became partners with you. And then as they as these applications start working, they start buying more of your product, then supply chain start buying it as well. So that was the first driver. So, and, then, yes. and then the second one, uh, more recently, you started adding salespeople and agents to start driving your business. And the third one is a uh, com- continued development of your product. But that, that's that right. much. Oh, that yes, much more concise than I said for sure. Thank okay, you. Uh, no problem. Um, can we can we go a little bit deeper into each of these three? So, for uh, back when you first started, you had a new product, you had a new customer. Um, how did you find them? Which came first? You had the product, then you found the customer. Or you had a customer who had this problem, and you said, "I can solve that." It, it, it's a, it's kind of funny. I was just talking to a group of high school students about this before mistakes and challenges early on. We actually had a customer before we had a product. Um, so I guess it started with an idea. I, um, I discussed this idea with you a little bit earlier of being able to get higher resolution microscopy to scale products, but I didn't. We didn't have a market in mind specifically, um, and we certainly didn't have a product built. Uh, We had algorithms and ideas, Um, but a company that makes uh, power devices that had a huge challenge, and I I met really through social circles, um, uh, they said, well, if you had an inspection tool like what I was describing, I know our company would be very interested. So we took a meeting. They were very interested in the ideas that we had. by the, by the way, I work with my father, who I worked with before, too. So it was my father and I actually went into that meeting. And um, we sold uh, an instrument based on an idea. Uh, that's a scary thing to do. Uh, but we, we then, you know, then that pushed us to very quickly build the thing. Um, so we talk about customers being partners early on. They, they were really a partner. Um, we're very lucky that they are still a customer and they and they continue to make us a better company um, and have helped promote us even so they invested in your product before it even existed they and they knew that as well (laughs) yeah 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 they knew it (laughs) they knew it to the extent to a large extent i mean they helped us define what the product would be right and they knew that you had nothing to give them right away that it was going to be developed you know, yeah. Based on their yeah, I mean, we did it very quickly, but it wasn't right away, right? We couldn't, we couldn't just, we didn't have a factory to put it in a box and send it. Yeah, okay. So how long did it take before, uh, you know, from the time that they signed the agreement and you actually gave it to them, developed and had it working for them? You know, I don't remember exactly, but I would say six months. Okay, awesome. And they funded everything for you from their initial payments? No. Um, so the first money... Um, I put, you know, my, my family, we put into ourselves. We had a previous business and it was acquired. And so we put a little bit of money in first. Once we, once this happened, then I started going out and raising money. So I raised um, some sort of an angel money at that point, um, eventually raised venture money and sovereign wealth money. But at that time, you know, and I, I had no experience in that, but sort of went, went to people that I knew that we might be interested and started raising money. Okay. So, uh, but then um, once it delivered, then they uh, paid full price for it, I suppose, once it got delivered and was working properly for it. Yeah, I, yeah, the full price and that we were just defining what the price would be with them. <laughs> so we never sold it, I never sold it until before, but yeah. Okay, okay that's great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, having people, um, you know, invest with you at the very beginning, that's a good validation that you have an idea that can stick, right? Yeah, we've been so lucky for that. Cus- customers have taken chances on us um, and... You know, I, I hope that it seems that we're delivering for them by giving an enormous amount of attention because we know that we're learning along the way. Yeah. Um, can you share how much the customer invested with you at the very beginning? Uh, yeah, okay I mean, they, again, they weren't investors per se. They right, were customers. But, uh, yes. Or were they, not that they were willing to commit on an idea that hadn't yet really become reality. Yeah. I mean, I... I don't remember the exact price, but our, our systems sell between $100,000 and $300,000, something like that. Uh-huh. So it was, it, you know, it, it, 
being that it was a simpler tool at the time, it was probably on the lower end of that, but uh, they've since bought more more sophisticated. Sure. No, it's just uh, fantastic that they were willing yeah. to invest this. You know, it's not, a, not an insignificant sum, right? Well, for, for, for somebody who's never made anything, it was really, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that also tells me that the problem they had was really pressing and they really wanted a solution. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's still true in industry for for the markets that we address. Yeah. Now, can you describe what that problem is that's just so painful that a company is willing to pay someone who's never done it before to create a solution? Yeah, I mean, everybody has slightly different um, issues, but there there are some commonalities. Uh, one is that when you're when you're thinking about electronics or biologics or any of the types of customers we deal with. Um, humans have uh, an inherent um, inability to see things um, over a large area. We just get tired as humans. Um, our eyes tend to get tired. We start to make mistakes. Um, and there are just things that are too small to see. And in order to develop new products and in order to have the best quality for the products that they are already using, they need the aid of both the, the the ability to image, which we do with our microscopes, and then I think more importantly, recognize and have an automatic classification technique, which is the use of artificial intelligence to be able to say what it is that they are looking at. Um, we find often, and, and I think the most exciting thing we've found is that even the best of us, when we can, don't always get get it right. So we can look at, you know, we've had customers that have looked at images of different types of features. And they have said, well, this feature represents, you know, something called, you know, some type of uh, defect, like an, what would they call it, an octopus defect or something. And it's been wrong. Um, and that's just, it's, these are the experts. They're not bad at this, but, the, but a computer algorithm can sometimes get it even better. So when you're working with new materials, you're trying to advance, whether it's medicine or electronics and semiconductors, you, you need the aid of tools like ours, uh, or, or you just don't get the type of advantage, uh, advances that are necessary. Right, got it. Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about the second driver? You said you started adding salespeople and agents. Um, you know, at what point did you say, this is what we need to do? And, you know, how did you go about finding the right salespeople and agents to help grow your business? Yeah, I'm, I mean, we just we decided it when we realized that we had a product that um, was, uh, I guess, agnostic enough to work for many different types of, of customers, not just for not just these type of partnerships where we had to do a lot of specialty work. So when we realized we had the right customer, that, that type of customer base, then we could sort of scale it up. And we did, we started doing, you know, trade shows and talks and conferences. Um, the sales team that we, the, the, the people that we hired tend to have domain expertise and, you know, I think a lot of experience, not just being salespeople, but having spent time with technical people in the, in, in the worlds that we sell to. So we have salespeople that have worked in semiconductor industry, for industry, for instance, and so their contacts are in those industries. Um, and as we continue to add salespeople, we do look at that domain expertise. Uh, we also uh, just look for people that see, like we do, the p potential of the vision for growth of the company. Right. Now, now, did you go for the go for the model of actually having these salespeople full-time on your payroll or are they some, some, somewhat outsourced and they're more like selling agents? No. So in the United States, they are always on payroll. Um, and it's, it's, it's true in a lot of cases for nanotronics as a whole. Um, you know, for instance, you know, we have 110 employees right now. We had, you know, 30 a few years ago. So we tend to like to have a team, an in-house team, uh, and that's true with salespeople too. It's kind of a it's a technical product. It's a you know it's a challenging product to learn and to to message. So we we would love it if our sales team um, can learn our product and focus on us and not a lot of other clients. Um, in in places like uh, Asia and Europe, we do have agents that represent others, but they always have dedicated people to nanotronics. So the same thing will apply. 
All right, that makes sense. Now, what sort of marketing do you do to help your sales team with the lead generation and brand awareness and making it easier for them to begin the conversation, having people say, oh, yeah, I know about nanotronics? Yeah. I mean, it's something, this is a work in progress, like like everything with a company our size. I mean, everything is a work in progress. But um, we actively do a lot of trade shows, and we take a special pride in our brand. Um, we have, you know, things that, you know, industrial companies wouldn't always think about. You know, I think that that uh, our trade show booths, our, our branding, our logo, all of these things are... I, you know, are really meant to draw people in and to see that, well, these aren't old industries. These are, these are industries that are going to advance at a rate that needs to, if this sort of fourth industrial revolution that people are talking about is to happen. So branding ourselves as, as new is important to us, as, fu as future uh, is important to us with domain expertise in the past. So we do a lot of trade shows. Um, we, uh, are, um, you know, ex you know, e expanding our presence with doing things like this podcast and things I, as you know, I, I try, we try, we try to be thought leaders where we can. So, if, you know, whether it's television or in political circles. So I was involved with the uh, congressional testimony that I did recently and, um, you know, so trying to influence both politicians to influence the public to educate some um yeah, it's, it, you know that this is you know sort of where where we are right now we and uh, you know hopefully getting better as time goes by right it sounds like um your product has a lot of applications to it not just semiconductors like what other verticals do you see uh your your microscopes your ai your robotics can be helpful yeah i mean it, it literally can be used for anything that makes anything. <laughs> so any company that makes anything. Now, you know, that would be crazy for us to to bite all of that off right now. But, um, for instance, we work with one of the largest, uh, well, the largest genomics company. Uh, so that's, it's, and, you know, it's sort of life science in a way. We work also with uh, some regenerative medicine um, companies. We work with a lot of aerospace companies now. So everything in aerospace, from sensors to um, to carbon for you know carbon for the uh, fuselage to jet engines. So if you look in really aerospace from from start to finish, uh, we work with chemical companies. So companies that make uh, everything from you know silica that's used for uh, fillers in tires, for instance, even to toothpaste. So you have the incredibly high tech to what would be considered low tech, but where our technology can help companies improve margins and create things in ways that hadn't been done before. Sounds like you have a lot to choose from. I say which ones to focus your attention on. How are you going to figure that out? Well, how, you know, it's always a combination of trying to move very quickly and move iteratively. Um, it makes sense that we we look at we look at everything you know whether it's power devices or traditional semiconductors um, as being our natural first markets. Um, so we continue to focus on those industries, uh, but then we find that genomic sequencing, for instance, is a very you know uses some very similar back end technologies. So it makes sense for us to work with them. And then we were working with um, autonomous vehicles a lot now. They use LIDAR and other types of electronics that are similar. So it, it's usually there's this adjacency um, to everything that we are doing. And we're finding that even though we're talking about the whole world and the possibility to do imaging and to do AI on everything, there's, there are very strange similarities that, uh, that maybe consumers wouldn't see that we see on the back end in the way things are actually made. Right. Um I'm not seeing the connection between semiconductors, <laughs> genomic sequencing, and autonomous vehicles. Can you share the commonality among those three? Sure. So uh, the most basic way to think of it is they all use advanced um, electronic systems to be able to, to move very quickly and make decisions very rapidly. 
So an autonomous vehicle uses something called LIDAR um, that is, you know, it, it is an electronic uh, system. Um, it's like a wafer, it's like a chip and has certain chipsets in them, um, works in a slightly different way, um, but it still requires inspection, classification, um, things that are difficult for humans to do. Um, in genomics, they, in, they do these things called flow cells where you, when you're trying to you know, sequence uh, DNA, the substrate of what you're using in order to sequence those has to be incredibly pure um, and free of defects. Um, and so you can, you, know, you can imagine how crucial that is to not make mistakes. So any of these processes are incredibly important that there aren't mistakes made. I mean, you can, you, you can imagine that for uh, you know, an autonomous vehicle or whether you're sequencing somebody's uh, genome in order to make a medical choice based on it. Um, we're doing the inspection to make sure that that, that quality will be there. Right. So essentially, uh, applications where misidentification is really not acceptable. Exactly. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, so you're, from a marketing perspective, to help generate uh, mind share, um, you, you're talking about, you mentioned trade shows, you mentioned um, doing thought leadership activities, uh, being on TV, political circles. Uh, being on podcasts such as my own. Um, anything else you're doing in marketing? Are you doing any advertising? Um, we don't do a lot of advertising. We do some sponsorships that end up having some ads. But we do so, so some conference sponsorships that um, get you know our our name and logo out there. We don't maybe some very specific trade magazines. We will take um, an ad in usually as a precursor to an event that we will be attending so that people know who we are before they attend. Um, but we, we don't have a very active ad campaign. When you sell equipment like we do, um, you know, it, pe people don't uh, take these kind of risks and spend this kind of money based on, on seeing an ad so much. Um, at least that's not, I, I think, the most ideal way for us to spend uh, our money, at least at the moment. Right. Well, I think one benefit of uh, doing the marketing, like doing the advertisement, is just um, building brand awareness. So when your salespeople yeah. do approach a company, uh, it won't be uh, totally from scratch. They'll go, oh, yeah, I know of Nanotronics. I've seen, you know, I've read about you. I've seen your advertisements. Yeah. And I they mean, might not even realize right, that right. it can be subtle. Absolutely. Writing papers, being at trade shows, having our name in as many articles as possible, and, yes, having – at the right time, advertisement placed. If if we really are connected, if we know that our potential audience is very connected to that publication, right? Yeah, you definitely you definitely don't want to waste your dollars uh, advertising in a medium where your audience isn't there or just not interested in the topic at that time. So. Right. Um, the third driver. You talk about continuous development. Can you share a little bit about how that works? You know, you know what directions you're taking your product. How you figure out that, those directions. Yeah, so this is this is driven in two different ways. Um, luckily, we had a very you know we've had some successful funding um, in the last two, couple of years, and that has gotten us out of just the you know reactive type of uh, development. Um, well, that first customer I told you about that's that's kind of reactive. It's we we have somebody we have to meet a deadline and ship something. Um, in order to create a core product then that we will ship to a lot of other people. Our R&D efforts now, we also have, we have a completely separate R&D group where we hire really a best-in-class um, physicists that are op in optics and in artificial intelligence um, and other areas where we can start to make a platform that will apply to any industry. Um, and this is, this is something then we can enter into partnerships and have a platform uh, that can support those partnerships rather than just having a off-the-shelf product. Um, now, we, st we still, of course, do have this off-the-shelf product, and it's very important to us, but it's another way to extend partnerships and see what's out there in the world so that it serves a kind of uh, biz dev purpose, but it also allows us to have customers where we can spend more R&D time to and and resources to and 
you know, to, to make something that is completely new um, that others aren't offering. Right. That makes sense, right? You want to give your customers what they want to need, right? As opposed to, uh, uh, you can't always be like Apple and create something in advance and then have people go, people go, wow, I do need that, right? Right. Yeah, so, exactly. All right. Fantastic. Um, for 2018, you're, you're looking at eight digits in revenue. So, um, you know, if you... You know, that's, that's, that, that means 10 million and up. So you've doubled your business from 2017 to 2018. Um, what's your plan for 2019? Well, you know, I, 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 hate, I hate to make too many predictions, but, we, you know, we'd like to see, some, you know, similar, uh, similar type of growth. So it, we see doubling of revenue as being kind of a necessity for us. Doubling in one year? Yep. Wow. At a, this point. <laughs> at uh, this point. Uh, uh, do you find that to be a, a, a achievable? Do you see it as a stretch? No, it's it's definitely achievable be, because of what I was saying earlier that we really didn't have active sales and marketing until very recently. So now that we have a product that works and that we have good customer recommendations, um, we have some investments so that we can personally um, invest in in in. Uh, in expanding our sales and marketing role, it's you know you, you know still most people don't know who we are you know so the, so there's plenty of uh, of room you know we don't, we're certainly not saturating any market yet right <laughs> so it's very achievable and very necessary for us. yeah yeah and, and and even if you don't uh, the way I say it if you have goals like I plan to double my revenue even if you come in at fifty percent higher seventy percent higher it's still a pretty good growth no one's gonna say it was a disappointing year. Well, I will always say it's a disappointing year, but you know, <laughs> we uh, we want to hold it. You know, we're. I think that the expectations for us are very high um, mm -hmm. from our investors, from our staff, and certainly from me. To, um, without that type of growth, we're also not making the type of impact that I right like. for sure. And you, I'm sure there are comp competitors out there who are seeing what you're doing and they're getting inspired by what you're doing, right? And you don't want them to make inroads while, well, you know. Well, I mean, that's that's probably true. I I don't pay much attention to it, but and perhaps I should. Um, but there is there is that that sense that um, we should be the brand name that's associated with doing this stuff. So the faster we can, you know, I, I think that we're feeling. I, I certainly. Without thinking of any competitors per se, they could always come along. So the more that the more inroads we can make now in, in both brand recognition, as you say, and actually having deployed tools, the better. Yeah. So what do you think are the would be the biggest challenges of uh, doubling your business next year? Uh, I'm, so there's always there are there are. Oftentimes in businesses like ours, decisions are made slowly. You know, so if we're selling capital equipment, even if even if companies like us, um, it's sometimes you sometimes have a large lead time on actually getting um, to getting a purchasing decision made. Um, they're spending a lot of money for our tools, so that's always something to keep in mind. Um, we and then there are things that are out of our control. Um, there are macroeconomic um, conditions, you know, um, we, we don't know what the economy will do. We don't know how trade will affect business. Now, I don't actually worry so much about that um, because I, I, I think that there are ways that Nanotronics addresses all of those things that we, that we will do okay, um, that, that we have plans, whether we are working in a domestic market, international market, throughout um, a vast supply chain or vertically integrated companies um, but it's certainly something that is those things that are out of our control uh, um, are still things to be concerned about right um, you know and you know and I always just I mean I see nothing on the horizon but I always worry about um, you know us keeping keeping up with expectations from uh, you know from quickly growing technological markets. Now, again, that's not a problem for us. It's what challenges us and keeps us going. Right. But, but you know, it's scary. It, you know, it, it, it always has to keep me up at night. Yeah. Well, 
That's what uh what the the book by the Intel guy, uh, only the paranoid survive, something like that. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, uh, and I I do agree with that to a to a large extent, right? <laughs> yes. So. Well, okay. At least I I it, I guess it speaks well for my my survival. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> paranoia, yeah. a, a anxiety uh, for the business is uh, <laughs> if that speaks well, <laughs> then maybe we'll do well. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you it, it's it's a very easy to become complacent on your success, right? And then you don't make the changes, you, you're not comfortable uh, doing something different because you've had success doing exactly what you've been doing, but then the market changes on you, right? And and uh, you can uh, become complacent and then soon become irrelevant if you just stay the same. So I, I agree. Right. Well, no to... worry about that from, from us yet. Yes, I don't think so, not yet at least. Um, how about in terms of the, the marketing and sales side of things for – uh, 2019, right? You want to double your business, so potentially you need to double the number of uh, customers you're working with, potentially, right? Right. So, you know, what's the plan on helping your salespeople find? Well, we don't companies? necessarily have to double the num number of customers we're working with. I mean, we hope to do that as well, but we mm -hmm. also um, customers can scale internally as well. So, right. You know, they can buy one tool from us one year, and you know, as they tend to like us, buy ten the next year. So, um, so it's a combination of increasing our um, presence with the customers we have and get, getting new customers. Right. Yeah. I imagine getting more business from your existing customers is probably uh, relatively easier because you have the relationship and, and once they see the success, they're going to be really keen on, on uh, applying your tools elsewhere, right? Right. Well, yes. And um, it's, it, you know, our service organization is, I think, a, a, a big focus of ours. So, we feel confident in that, that type of growth. And it also doesn't, it, it doesn't require adding larger sales team for those. Um, it may uh, require adding one, more service team, um, but as far as staffing, it doesn't, it doesn't require as, as, as big as so. Right. How about in terms of finding new business? Um, do you have any initiatives to help your sales team on that front? Um, you know, I, I think... You know, I spoke a little bit earlier about adjacencies. So there, are, there are, is there, there are a lot of internal discussions, and when we're looking to hire new salespeople, about what those adjacencies are. You know, we, if you were to tear apart a Tesla car, um, what are the components in that car that a nanotronic system can work in? What if you look at an airplane? What are the systems that that we are already supplying, and what are those that we could? And it's not that hard to start to see that there are a lot of parts of, of any device. We work through, for some of the larger smartphone makers, for instance, we work through the entire supply chain from the, uh, from the glass on the front to the many chipsets inside to the coatings on the back to the camera sensor. Um, so, you know, I think that there is some creativity in going into what, what are those things where we're, supply, we're supplying to companies that make some of the components for what if we supplied for all of those components and so that becomes kind of a natural um, business dev uh, activity for us I think in, in approaching new markets right it makes sense especially if they're buying a component and both the uh, supplier and the buyer are uh, both verifying that the component are, are meeting two specs right right then exactly. I can see how, yeah. I mean, if 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 if, if the buyer is verifying things with your tools to make sure it's uh, up to snuff, um, the the supplier mm -hmm. of that product might want to do it as well. Yep. Yep. And they say, and you're using the same equipment, so there's no disagreement, right? Exactly. So, uh, two last questions for you, Matthew. Who are your ideal customers, and what's the best way for them to contact your company? You know, it's our our ideal customers are customers who um, actively want to you know build something that is more build their own companies in ways that are you know more advanced than I've seen before. So you talk about not having complacency on our part. Our ideal customers are those that don't aren't complacent either, um, and, and so that that means a lot of active engagement from them, them pushing us, challenging us so that ultimately we end up with a better product. So those customers can be in any field at all. Uh, I spoke about, you know, we have a, a customer in autonomous vehicles right now. It not, you know, 
they have this huge urgency to get autonomous vehicles onto in, into the market. And there's no room for complacency there. So they become a very important customer. Um, the it, next generation semiconductor, they're at, we're at a point where Moore's law is coming to an end, if you know, arguably it's already ended. So a lack of complacency um, it is, is certainly relevant there as well. So our ideal customers are those that notice the challenges that they have and try to and, and realize that they can turn to new types of solutions. And what's the best way for them to contact your company? Oh, I mean, they can they they can, they can give us a call. They can send us an email. Um, they can come, they can see us at a trade show. Um, we you know clearly our lines are open to speak with anybody. Okay. Did you want to share your phone number, your website, your email address here? Sure. So our um, our our email address um, is uh, nanotronics.co. Um, not, not com, but co, um, you, you can't, you know, people can reach out to me directly if they want, which is Matthew at nanotronics.co. Um, I, I think if you go to the website, there are a number of phone numbers and other ways to other people to contact as well. And after a year from now, when you're twice as big, those phone numbers will be changing probably probably more lines. So probably better to not share the number here when it's going to be yeah, a, more exactly. numbers will be listed on your website. So. Exactly. No, I'm not trying to hide anything, but I'm, <laughs> I honestly sometimes I don't know which phone number is always the best. But yeah, any, you know, anything you find, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us today, Matthew, and sharing how you accelerated your company's high value sales. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. We've been speaking with Matthew Putman, the founder and CEO of Nanotronics, about his company's rapid growth. For interviews with other fast-growing, high-value sales companies, or to learn how we can accelerate your firm's high-value sales through automation, visit Eversprint.com.